Hello, welcome to module six. I am um, recording from my house today, so you'll notice I have a blurred background because um, it's chaos here and my almost four year old might be interrupting us any minute. So fingers crossed I can get through this um, quick lecture for you guys. It's um, a pretty limited, I'm trying to really focus in on a few things. I have a little more expertise in to kind of talk through and bring to life for you this week. So let's dive in. Oh goodness. Okay. So just a review of our key concepts. Um, we're starting to get into our civil rights era, um, kind of the 40s through the 60s in the US. So, um, you know, usually when we think, start thinking about civil rights, we're really thinking about um, race um, in the civil rights movement. Uh, but there were a lot of civil rights um, campaigns and activism happening at this point. So a lot of things around indigenous people's rights, welfare rights, women's rights, disability, um, LGBTQ. So just a lot happening. This is kind of our time in history where we're seeing a lot of really good progress uh, for marginalized or oppressed populations. Um, and then you'll kind of see us move into our conservative response next week. So this is really one of the last times in history up until, you know, arguably now that we had a progressive kind of movement um, towards equity for people. Okay, so here's some key policies. We're gonna dive into each of these a little bit. So the National School Lunch Program. So, um, you know, we all know this school lunch program. It, it's currently, um, you know, still in place. It, even in its very earliest edition, um, did what it was meant to do. It provided school meals to qualified students. That's our free or reduced lunch program. And in a lot of ways, it still looks similar. Um, the important things to know about this policy um, when you're understanding it, especially today, is that this policy really lives under the USDA um, regulation. And so it gets reauthorized or it gets um, changed through something in Congress called the Farm Bill. So whenever you hear the term Farm Bill, kind of perk up because um, it has a lot to do with food security measures, especially for kids. Um, so just kind of an odd thing, this, all the food programs kind of live under this USDA, a um, little bit different than a lot of our other social welfare programs. So current implications. So I was um, thinking about the school lunch program and here in Missoula where I live, um, right now we're still under the CARES Act. So all food, all school lunches and breakfast and snack are free for all kids regardless of income. It's great, don't have to pack my son a lunch. Um, that is probably going to go away depending on if they if Congress reauthorizes or, it or not. Um, so before that happens, so in normal world, outside pandemics and outside the CARES Act, we have something called community eligibility provision. Now, if you work in social services, you might be familiar with this term. It exists for other things, but for school lunch in particular, um, a district can apply to be CEP if they have a certain amount of students in their school that meet the qualifications for free and reduced lunch. So this is really nice because then they can do away with all the paperwork and applications and again just give free lunch um, and breakfast to every kid in that school so it really eases an administrative burden on that school um, so they just have to be able to show that hey you know I think it's 40 percent or 30 some percent of our kids are at free and reduced school lunch income levels and then you they're able to just say okay we're just going to do free um lunch for all and they get reimbursed for a different program. So it kind of just cuts out that bureaucratic red tape. Community eligibility provision is really important. So this is an area where if they aren't, if we get outside of pandemic time, and I'm sure we will go back, um, at least in some areas where we don't have free lunch for everyone anymore. If you live in or know of an area near you where they're not participating in community eligibility provision when they 
could be, um, that would be something to advocate for. Actually, in Missoula, a few years ago, our school board went away from allowing community eligibility provision because we had a lot of school lunch debt. Um, or the program had some debt. And so they were trying to make up for that debt. But what it really ends up doing is harming families and harming food insecure families the most. Um, so um, it's a really a great program to allow for community eligibility provision um, when you're able to. Okay, so um, additionally, food security groups um, like No Kid Hungry is a great one. If you have a big interest in food security, you can sign up for their newsletters. Um, food Research and Action Council is another one. They are in a push now to kind of continue this um, food for every for all school children for free, regardless of income program, because it's just been so wildly successful in helping with um, food insecurity during the pandemic. Okay, social security disability insurance. Um, this is our current SSDI. This was something, you know, that kind of the old age security insurance happened in the 30s, you'll remember. And then, so in the 50s, they added in this disability um, section that has been, you know, folks, um, with disabilities are much, are impoverished at much higher rates. Um, so this was a really important program. Even today, it's very underfunded in the way that uh, folks who get SSDI don't get very much money. They're still very much living um, at or near poverty line. So, um, but much better condition and a really important social program. Food stamp program, this is currently called SNAP or Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. This came out of the 60s. Um, Lyndon Johnson in 1964 ended up signing that. Um, you know, this the objective, which we don't really probably think of as much today, was really to strengthen the agricultural economy. So it was really trying to match food that might've been going to waste um, from our agriculture. Um, system to people who need it. So it really started as that, which is kind of an interesting piece. Um, and then of course, it also meant to provide nutrition um, to low income households. Um, you know, if we kind of think back to those key terms from week one, um, this is a residual means tested policy, right? So it's not like you know, the current free food for all situation we have with school kids, which is, would be a universal program. This is the, that residual or means tested type where you have to prove um, an income level. Um, you have to prove you're trying to work. There's a whole lot of um, barriers, I guess, placed around the food stamp program. You really have to prove that you deserve it, right? Kind of that line of like, deserving the deserving poor and making sure that people are really trying their best before they'll get any government support. Um, this is um, has some divided funding between state and federal so states can kind of mess with their food stamp program a lot or their SNAP program. Um, interesting kind of world to work in. So I have done a lot of food policy lobbying and um, it's just, it's pretty interesting what you get asked at the legislature. So I've been on committees where I was advocating for additional food stamp um, SNAP benefit at farmer's markets, um, a small a state appropriation to kind of influx more money into that program so that in the summer people can get more fruits and vegetables on their SNAP card. And I actually had a legislator ask me why we didn't require people on SNAP to grow gardens. Um, so just some really incredibly out of touch comments and questions. And we actually do have a seed program, a really cool seed program with the state where if you apply and you want to grow a garden, um, they will provide you with seeds to do so. Um, obviously, that's an incredibly classist, inappropriate question, given that people in poverty are often working way more hours um, than other people and have additional barriers to growing gardens, like 
probably living um, in a place with not a lot of land that they're allowed to dig up. Um, so just a good example of how kind of out of touch sometimes our lawmakers on with understanding people that are utilizing these services, which is really an important part um, where social workers can come in and advocate. Okay. Medicare and Medicaid, um, 1965, these get established, um, really wildly successful programs for providing health insurance, right? We know that um, largely senior citizens do not ever want Medicare to go away. Um, it's a really important safety net program. Um, and Medicaid, we have seen that expand um, in many states, including Montana, to really provide coverage um, for people up to 130% of the poverty line. So a million um, people in Montana and of that about 100,000 people are covered by expanded Medicaid, not even just regular Medicaid, but the expansion portion that we put into place. So um, yeah, over 10% of our population in Montana is covered by Medicaid. Um, so just incredibly important program. It is always up on the chopping block at the legislature. So something to really watch in Montana. Um, when we've seen cuts to Medicaid, we see just a decimation in social welfare services across the state that can be really, really harmful for our clients. Um, and they often make us lose jobs in social services. So case management gets cut, um, different social work services are cut across the state. A lot of offices of public assistance have closed down due to cuts. So this is something you really wanna watch as a social worker um, is what's happening with Medicare and Medicaid. School breakfast program. Um, this was one of those 1960s laws. Um, it did get, it was initially kind of a, a trial. They wanted to just see if it worked to feed kids. Um, and then it was made permanent in 1975. Um, so schools get reimbursement for each meal um, they provide. Um, and then it has a nice provision in it where if it's a high, um, need school or a low SES school, um, they get a little bit higher reimbursement rate. So that's, that's a nice um, thing. There's some other really cool science that you can find about school breakfast program. There's a big push for breakfast after the bell. There's a lot of science behind if you let kids play first and then the bell rings and then they come in and then you offer them the nutritious breakfast. They're so much more likely to eat instead of if you offer them breakfast or going out to play. Um, you know, nine times out of 10, those kids um, are going to either feel social pressure to go out and play, even if they're hungry, or they're just going to want to go out and play. So um, if you can advocate in your community um, to have them do breakfast after the bell, it's a really, really good thing for kids who are in food insecure households. Okay, moving into just a couple more things, the um, Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968. So um, I know you did a little bit of reading on this, but this was really a response to um, bad things that were happening in tribal nations. So it was, um, there were some tribal leaders where a lot of times it was feeling like indigenous people didn't have the same constitutional rights because of how they were being treated. So even little, even little, <laughs> even the civil liberties um, issues, free speech, being able to practice it, whatever religion they want, um, they weren't able to do those things. Um, and so after that came to light over and over, they, Congress finally did pass this. Um, there are some limitations to it. Um, and there's a lot of criticism of it that you can go um, and look at. This is kind of just a touching on this. Um, but a couple of the limitations is that there's no obligation of a tribe to provide a lawyer. So off of tribal reservations, um, it's required that all citizens be provided a lawyer, even if you can't afford one. That is not the case um, under this Indian Civil Rights Act. Um, and then there's also no right to a jury trial in civil cases. So that can, um, be sometimes seen as discriminatory depending on kind of the judge situation. Okay. Welfare rights. Yeah, this is a big issue. Um, I hope that you've read that NPR article about the welfare rights movement and all the mostly women who participated in that. Um, and just kind of thinking through the intersection of being poor and being Black and um, 
what those women were experiencing. They're watching, you know, their counterparts of white women being having the luxury of being able to stay at home with children, raise children. Um, and a lot of what that article is getting to is women at this time were saying, we want those luxuries too. We want to be able to stay home and raise our children. Um, even though, you know, there's such incredible white supremacy in this country that has basically made the situation where we have to work low wage jobs in order to just survive. So um, it seemed very radical at that time. And obviously, if you're thinking about it, um, from our intersectional lenses, it makes a ton of sense that that was what they wanted and that they were asking for, um, you know, the same quality of life that so many people, um, especially white people were enjoying. So there's still so many implications from um, this era of welfare rights. And we're really gonna get into that kind of in the, the conservative response. So there was a push in these, these kind of 60s time um, and a little bit of an expansion of welfare and help for people. And then we're gonna have a big backlash against that in the conservative response. And we'll talk more about kind of the stereotyping and the false narratives that got really perpetrated around that. But some that I still see to this day at the legislature, um, you know, it'll be things like I had a legislature legislator who's also owns a grocery store um, when I was talking to him about SNAP benefits and how important they are and how they support families and they support working people. And he was telling me that someone paid for their wedding cake um, using their SNAP card. And he was uh, like laughing about it um, and just thought that it, that it was so ridiculous and inappropriate. And, you know, I was just like, oh, that's so interesting, Senator. So you don't think people who are poor should be allowed to have wedding cakes or kind of like, what's the issue here? And trying to draw out, you know, what, it, what are your, what are your values here? If that's something that you're saying. So um, you still really see those, you know, the false narratives around people are lazy, people are scamming the system. You know, the average person who's using food stamps or SNAP benefits, even in Montana, is a woman with one child who's on um, SNAP for less than six months. So this idea that people are just perpetually abusing the system, um, you know, committing fraud with their SNAP benefits is so off the mark. The only real occurrences of fraud that have ever been proven around food stamps or SNAP is um, more at like the corporate level, like a grocery store that was um, creating fraudulent ways to charge that program. So you're really not seeing that stuff um, with actual users. So it's just, it's really important to know that and to fight back against those stereotypes um, with information like you're hopefully learning in this class um, and that you'll continue to learn as we go forward. All right, last slide here is just a couple of references. Um, let me know if you have any questions and thanks for all the great posts this week there. Um, they've been really interesting.